everyone. Happy Saturday. This is uh, Nitha Ramachandra from the NR, NR Hour Sports Show. This is episode 893. I'm joined by a really special guest. His name is Ben Troop. Troop is a former NFL tight end, and he, and he played for Florida Gators. And I got him on good timing because college football is back. Let's go. NFL comes back next week. And uh, I'm just happy that football is back. And we're, he's a former NFL tight end. And uh, he, he played for the Florida Gators, Tampa Bay uh, Buccaneers, Oakland Raiders, now Las Vegas Raiders, Tennessee Titans. He was an SEC championship, first team all, all SEC, first team all American. What a great career he had in the NFL and college. And now he's an author, speaker, and he has a show. You can find him on ESPN Radio also. And uh, he has a podcast coming out, which we'll get to. But first of all, Ben, uh, thank you again for coming on the show. How are you doing and your family? I'm doing, I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. So I want to start off with your childhood growing up. And and you grew up in Georgia, too. So what was it like growing, growing up as a kid in Georgia? And when did you realize that you wanted to play sports, especially football, and uh, did you have any, like, role models growing up in the NFL? Uh, man, well, I'm from a country town, uh, Swainsboro, Georgia, to where, I mean, all you are, you know, football or sports is just your, just a way of life. Well, number one, it's a way to get out your mama's house. Like, get up out my house. You, you're not going to be running through my house all day. But I got an older brother that's a year older than me. So when I was six, I had to play soccer because you have to be seven to play football. So, um uh my my birthday is september 1st that's the cutoff oh, okay. so they went so my first year of football they was putting all the equipment back up yeah. and my mom was filling out the application <coughs> excuse me they were saying um miss troop your son can't play hmm. it's the cutoff my mom just she's not listening to him she's like this kid is getting out of my house like wow. he's getting out of my house so uh sports has always been a part of my life i mean the, the sport i fell in love with before football was track like, I used to run track. Um, football, obviously, man, because it's so physical, you know, throw up, tackle, things like that. I wrestled. I played tennis. But football for me, and football for me in Swainsboro, Georgia, man, that's all. I mean, you you just count the days to when you turn six or seven, and then you can play football and go out there and hit somebody wearing your little, uh, what they call them, our little jerseys we wore, yeah. we wearing to school. Uh, my mama didn't know this, but you would let her, you would let her, like, like, you know, it's like puppy love stuff. But you will let a girl that you like wear your jersey during a, um during yeah. during lunchtime. Yeah. But but she knew, hey, I need this bag after lunch. Like right. you're not walking around school with my <laughs> freaking jersey on. Yeah. But uh, no man, football has always been. It was like my escape, man. Like I know the football field. I don't. I can be whatever I want. I can kind of like put on my put on my like you know like shield of defense. Yeah. It kind of like be my alter ego. Like football to me was my um um instead of you know it was my dark night. Yeah, I'm not Bruce. I'm Bruce Wayne during the day. <laughs> I'm the dark night on that field, and it was the best, man. And and I would have never thought that that little brown football would have taken me as as far as it took me. Mm -hmm. But yeah, man, football has always been that fun part. Teammates, coaches, plays, touchdowns, lose lo losses, wins. So yeah, it, I mean, out of all the sports, I mean, like I said, I still love track. Mm -hmm. But man, football, man, just it gave it gave me an identity that I I I didn't know I I didn't know I needed, but it also gave me me. It showed me how to how to deal with that verse on it because everything in life happens on the football field. Yeah, like I said, you had a heck of a career, and you, you're I think you were the most underrated tight ends in the game too. And um, but I, I want to ask you, speaking of track, how did it? How in, in, in my opinion. Uh, I think track helps in a big way for athletes that want to play other sports like football, basketball, or whatever. So how did track help you in a big way? Because um, we had Chris Sanders on the show. If you, I'm sure you know him, a former mm -hmm. Titan, and he he did track too. So how did it help you in a big way to to help you translate into football? Like uh, discipline. Track is one of those things to where it's very, 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 very repetitive. Like it's it's just same things over and over and over and over. No, like I like I, I you know. Uh, I, I was a second leg in the four by one. I was a high jumper. I was a triple jumper. I was a long jumper. And and what it taught me is, is to harness my skills. Like, look, man, don't get so comfortable being talented. To go from talented to gifted is when you work on that talent to help to help it become a gift. And I didn't know that as a young age, man. I mean, I always ran track until I was like 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And I my family moved to Augusta when I was in the fifth grade. And I ran for the Road Runner Track Club it was a it was a summer track club AAU track. Eugene Lee Senior was my was my coach, and obviously his son Eugene Lee Junior was like the fastest guy on the team. And oh. man, once again, track. 
I got to travel. I got to go to Maryland and Atlanta. I actually went to the Nationals in Gainesville, University of Florida. Yeah. And I and I and I enrolled five years later. Wow. So track track teaches you that all you you got to give all you got. Like meaning when people go, I could have ran faster, or you you it teaches you how to be to self correct yourself. Like it gets you out of this. Hey man. The most successful person in any sport is just failing at a lesser rate than everybody. Like everybody's failing, right. but they're failing at a lesser rate. So it taught me how to take feedback instead of criticism because my coach was rough, man. I mean, I'm 12 years old. My coach was rough, hmm. but he taught me how to take coaching. He taught me how to be coachable mm -hmm. and he taught me how to pull my own weight. Like, you know, in, in track, man, everybody wants to be, you know, Usain Bolt, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, Carl Lewis. Yeah. Uh, everybody wants to be, you know, those guys out Michael with Johnson. medals on, but you realize you might be the ninth place. You might come in ninth. You might get last place, but you're right there with the best in the world. So yeah, man, track taught me a lot, man. It, it I, I, it's such a rhythm to it, man. It's a, it's a beautiful sport when you know what you're looking at. It's like watching boxing as a yeah. box is different than watching it as a onlooker. So for me, I didn't realize how much it was teaching me. But yeah, man, Eugene Lee Sr., man, I owe this man a lot, man. When it comes to coaches, I owe him a lot because he was rough, but <laughs> it was effective. Right. Right. So yeah, man, track, 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 track is a beautiful thing, man. I, I love it. And uh, like I said, man, I didn't realize how much I was learning from it while I was while I was going through it. And also, uh, Michael Johnson too up there in the track. Oh yeah, man. Of course, of course, Mike. I mean, listen you know, <laughs> to me, right. The, the the goat of all goats is Usain. Yeah, yeah. You got Carl Lewis, but I'm sorry, man. The gold cleats. I broke the record in the 200 and the 400 oh, yeah. and the four by one. I mean, taking my shoes off after I run through Maurice Green. It's it's a lot of guys, man, that I grew up watching, man. But yeah, Michael Johnson. Shout out. To, no no offense to Usain. No offense <laughs> to Carl Lewis. But yeah, Michael Johnson is the goat to me. That 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 dude was a he was ahead of his time. Yeah. So um. So for you, what was the experience like being part of nationals? And what, what was that like feeling like for you? It was a culture shock because once again, I'm from I'm from Swainsboro, Georgia, and I haven't been in Augusta, Georgia that long. Mm -hmm. So I went from a small town to a big city, but it it kind of showed me there was a there was a world much bigger than the world you come from. It's one thing if listen if I'm from if I'm from Philadelphia and I spent my whole life there, I think that that's what the world looks like, and you realize well it doesn't. Right. <clears throat> I mean, what freaked me out. Man, 12 years old, I, I kid you not. There was a 12-year-old. This guy had muscles. He had a mustache. He had a beard. He, he's 12. I'm like, so when they're calling a 12-year-old, because we, we, we went 11 to 12, we went 13 to 14, 15 to 16, I'm thinking he's in the wrong heat. I'm like, this dude, number one, he looks like a bodybuilder at 12. <laughs> and he has a full, he has a full, you know, uh, freaking uh, face full of hair. Wow. But it, it, was, it was great, man, because... Obviously, you know, those guys were just elite. But I got a chance to go out there and compete against the best 11 to 12 year olds in the world, man. And I wouldn't change it for nothing. That Florida heat was serious. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was torrential downpour. So we had to, because they couldn't cancel. We had to wait on the rain to end. Then we had to go out there. And yeah, man, it was um, the Nationals for me just adds to my, to my overall perspective in life, man, because I've had very, very, very unique opportunities in this life and all of them was surrounded i'm always surrounded by people who are just incredibly talented gifted but very humble because even the guy with the muscles man i mean we end up talking in the line i'm looking at him like you know he can see me staring at him but nah man it was um the nationals was great and obviously like i said i had no idea it was a precursor for me actually enrolling there five years later wow yeah so now transition transition to your football career and in high school um before settling settling on tight end um, did, did the coaches get, let you uh, – did you get to play any other positions other than tight end in, in high school? Well, high school was different, man, because my freshman year, I didn't play. So I didn't even play football my freshman year yeah. because I got – like I said, I got an older brother. So I was transitioning from, from middle school to high school life. My brother made high school seem like it was just the hardest thing in the world. So I'm like, well, let me not even focus on athletics. Let me just focus on academics. Then once I get there, I realize, well, it's not that bad, right? My sophomore year, it's crazy. I kid you not. My sophomore year, I went from like, I went from like five 
10, 5, 11 to like 6, 3 over a oh. summertime. So yeah. when I came back to school, the coach is looking up at me like, what in, like, what in the world happened, you know? Yeah. And it, and it was and mind you, my mom said I literally went to bed. My mom was like five seven five eight. She said you went to bed like five ten, hmm. and you woke up like six three six four. Like you walked past me, and I'm like, what? She said <laughs> so. So to me, uh, wow. And 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 so to be quite honest with you, the first time I knew what a tight end was, and when they told me, I was I didn't know what a tight end was. I'm like, <laughs> what? What's a tight end? And when they told me, hey, man, you like get to go out there and catch passes, block, and you just like a bigger receiver. Wow. And it took me, I didn't really, listen, I didn't really embrace it that much as a sophomore because I was on B, I was on junior varsity. As a junior, I was a true backup. Mm -hmm. This is what people don't know about me. I wasn't getting highly recruited, so I thought, as a junior, because I was using my cousin's address, not our address. So I was getting a letter here, a letter there, a letter here, a letter there. There was a guy that wrote a story about me in the Augusta Chronicle. He called me George's best kept secret. And he put it in the paper. And I don't know how much that article really helped, but my cousin, Hope, who I was using the address, she shows up to my house one day and we had the screen door, glass screen door. And she has two, it looked like two five, six foot trash bags filled. They're almost taller than her. Wow. Filled to the top hmm. on each side of her. And she told me, you got to stop using our address, dude. You get so much mail that the that the that the freaking uh, you know, the freaking postal worker he wraps it up in a in a rubber band and he sticks it in front of our door. He don't even put it in the mailbox because it's too mm -hmm. much. So, <laughs> I mean, like I said, man, God has very, been very very good to me, man. I you know I don't take no credit for these things. It's one of those things that I didn't go to a prestigious high school. Right. I wasn't putting out Division One athletes every single year. We weren't going to the playoffs. We weren't ranked in the state. If it's a, if it's if it's nine hundred high schools in Georgia, we was down there close to eight fifty, eight sixty. We way down there tonight in the night and close wow. to nine hundred. But I mean, I listen, man. I've always had two things, or well, three things. I've always had a great work ethic. I've always had great teammates, and I've always had great coaches, and I benefited from those things so much. So yeah, man. High school was high school was it went by fast. But everything I wanted to achieve in high school, it more to superseded my expectation. Yeah, to me, to be honest, uh, it's not it's not about wh which school, how big it is, or how small it is. It's it's, it's a hard work, dedication, and, and 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 if you put it if you put it in the right mindset, then you'll get there. That's that's uh that's what I go by. And um, so for you, speaking of the the, the growth spurt, did, did you ever think that you, you, you did you ever think about that growth spurt that you could have had it? And the next part to this. Um, would you say the growth spurt helped you in a big way? Uh, where you at right now? Oh, uh, well, my father, you know, my father's like six two, six three. My mom's like five eight. So I was gonna be a tall, athletic looking dude no matter what. Because the second old so how it goes in my family, the second oldest son is always taller than the oldest. My brother is a lot shorter. My brother's like five eleven, six yeah. feet, maybe. So my dad is a lot taller than his older brother. So it's almost like this is what coaches say. You don't want your you don't want your physical uh, presence to not to supersede your athletic ability. Yeah. You don't want to look a certain way and not play that way. So in my mind, I started looking very very imposing, but my athletic ability hadn't caught up yet. So once again, it goes back to like my track days. Man, it just yeah. out me. a lot of four letter words. Being do this, being do that, being do this. But my coach told me so. He said, "Man, all you got to do is buy in." Like you got to buy in. Right. And I didn't know, man, I'm, I graduated high school at 17 years old. So, I mean, I don't know about no buy in. I don't know. So what, but once I understood what he meant, it started clicking, man. Like football became, it didn't, become, it wasn't easy. It just wasn't as hard anymore. And my coach said, listen, man, he goes, Ben, when you doing the play, when you running the route, until you catch the ball, you're doing what you're coached to do. Mm -hmm. He said, once you put your hands on that ball, your gifts will take over. Hmm. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, once and, and and it was crazy. That's kind of how it was. Like, like, and that's I was like, okay. He said, just do what we coach to do. Do what you coach to do. Oh. So I did what. And then what, what? The highlight of my high school career was not going, not getting a scholarship to the University of Florida, mm -hmm. even though I, I thank God every day for it. 
I wanted to play when, when all the when you'll see all the All Star games come out, all the rosters come out. You got the East West Shrine game, you got the North West, you got the North yeah. North South game. Now I and I got invited to both of those, but I was like, that's back when they played the Florida Georgia hmm. High School All Star game, and I wanted to play in that. Now think now think about that. I got it on a team that won, we won probably three games my senior year, I think, but I wanted to do that. So one day I was in ROTC four years of high school. I was in ROTC four years. I'm in my class and my coach comes over, head coach comes over. He says, Ben, I need you to come with me. He's not talking to me though. He's not saying a word. I'm thinking I'm in trouble. Like, did I do something? Did I, did one of my teachers say I was talking too loud? Whatever. Yeah. He ain't talking to me though. We walk from ROTC all the way to his office. It's a phone, it's off the hook. He said, pick up the phone. Mm. And I go, hello? He said, hello, I said, hello. He said, how you doing, Ben? This is so-and-so. I'm the commissioner of the Florida Georgia High School All-Star Game. Congratulations. Wow. You got selected. And I'm thinking this is a joke. <laughs> I'm like, hello? I'm thinking this is a joke. Yeah. But it was real. And I got to meet Ronnie Brown, the second overall pick in 2005 out of Auburn. Oh, wow. I got to meet Vince Wilford, great defensive tackle for the New England Patriots in the Miami. Uh, David Green, star quarterback for Georgia. Sean Jones, star defensive back for Georgia. I mean, all these players, right? And they asking me about me. Hey man, where you from? Where is that? Because I didn't realize in the state of Georgia, if you're from Atlanta, you don't know nothing about Augusta, Georgia. Right. You don't know nothing about Swainsboro. So I was kind of like, it's that culture thing again. They telling me about their side of the state. Mm -hmm. I'm telling about my side of the state. Now when we got to talking about high school football and our teams, my conversation got real short because I don't, I don't really got a lot to say about it. But and the crazy part about it is in 2000, in June, David Green, the quarterback of Georgia, threw me the game-winning two-point conversion to beat Team Florida. Oh, wow. Two years later, 2002, I catch the game-winning touchdown pass to beat Georgia, and the quarterback for Georgia is David Green. Oh, wow. So, so, so it's, almost like, it's almost like deja vu. You can't make this stuff up. I catch a game-winning touchdown pass to beat Team Florida. I catch the game-winning touchdown pass to beat the University of Georgia, That's and the crazy. same guy... It's like watching me do it. So it's it's wild, man. My, my life is a freaking dream. It, it don't even seem like it's mine, but I, I accept it humbly. You know, like I said, man, I'm still I'm still benefiting from things that happened 20 years ago to this very day. Wow, that's awesome. That, that, that's a that's a great moment right there. Uh, especially playing against I mean playing with the team your the Sean and then playing against Sean. That's crazy. Um so I want to speaking of your college recruiting process, uh, what was that like for you? And what was the process like? And obviously you chose Florida. Do you have, do you have any other offers out there? And what made you choose Florida? Well, yeah, I mean, I was blessed to have a lot of offers, man. Uh, if it was a team, in the, I mean, I know I had, you know, NC State, North Carolina, Clemson, South Carolina, Florida State, Tennessee, Georgia, UAB. If it was a team in the Southeast, they had offered me. The reason why I chose Florida was, man, my mom is a, is a God-fearing woman, man. And like I said, we don't, I've never went through anything like this. So I got an older cousin named Purcell. He's 10 years older than me. He heard I was getting recruited. And he, I went to my grandmother's house, man, to Vidalia, and he was there. And he said, hey, man, if Steve Spurrier come to your house, you do not tell that man no. Now, mind you, I'm like, what are you? Because I don't know. I'm like, what is he talking about? Why was Steve Spurrier, the head coach of Florida, come to my house? Wow. But like I said, it's early in the recruiting process. It ain't like it is now. It's even crazier now. But I remember this, man. I'm sitting, I'm, I'm, I didn't realize how big of a recruit I was. I didn't know how. So when you start talking about visits, my very first visit was supposed to be North, North Carolina State was the first team to offer me. Oh, oh. I was supposed to go, I was supposed to fly to North Carolina State for an official visit. My mm -hmm. flight left at eight o'clock. I got to the airport at 7.50. Wow. So when I, they said, what you here for? I'm here to go, I'm, I got a flight. They was like this. So. Now, Augusta Airport is not big. They they say, you see this, you see this plane out here? Yeah, that's your plane, and you're not. I, and this is what I said. So they gonna stop? They gonna let me? They go? No, they're not gonna stop. So you can walk out there and get up. No, that's not how you know. So I missed that flight, but uh, I I chose Florida, man. One, my mother prayed about it. She said God showed her gators in her future, and out of all the coaches, Lou Holtz from uh, South Carolina, Terry right. Bow, Tommy Bowden from from Georgia, Jim Dunning from wow. Georgia. The first coach to come to my house was Florida, was, was Steve Spurrier. Hmm. And man, he was a rock star coach back then. Like, you know how you got, you know, the Nick Sabins and the Kirby Smarts yeah. and the Dan Mullins. He was like that back then. Hmm. So when he come to my house, 
I said, you know, two assistant coaches come in. They give the whole spiel about going to Florida, the best of both worlds, academically, athletically, you know, best of best of everything. And Coach Spurry, he, he looked like he was nodding off. <laughs> and before he before he fell asleep, they kind of nudged him. And he said, Ben, you going to be with us? He said, Ben, you going to be with us? I go, yes, sir. And I still went on all my recruiting trips. I went to South Carolina. I went to Clemson. Hmm. I went to uh, Louisville. I went to Florida. I went to Georgia. I went to Georgia. On my, you get five official visits. I went to right. I went to Georgia four. When I go to Georgia, it was I, I I felt like a quarterback. How they was catering to me. Hey Ben. Hey Ben. Hey, this is so and so. Like the coach is taking me around, shaking people's hands. This is so and so. This is where you'll be staying. Mind you, all the other recruits over here. I go sit in the coach's office, and they got they got a guy with eighty four on his chest, but they got it blacked out all over the office. Like Ben, you catch. I'm like I'm looking around everywhere you look. It's like articles of me. And I'm thinking to myself, and they try to act like this is regular. What's up, Ben? I'm like this. What? And I didn't realize how hard they was recruiting me. Wow. But um, and and they and before I left, they said, Ben, you can go ahead and commit to us, man. You don't even got to go. You don't even got to go to um go to Florida. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, how do you know I'm going to Florida? Oh, we know everything about you. <laughs> you know, so so recruiting for me yeah. was was it's it was a blessing, but it's crazy because on the week of National Signing Day, they called it a dead period. Hmm. You're not supposed to get in contact with recruiters. Right. February 3rd or 4th, 2000, that's National Signing Day. You're not supposed to talk to anybody. When I wake up on the phone, my mom said, Jim Dunn, the head coach of Georgia is on the phone. He want to talk to you. On, and I'm like, I'm on here like, hello, what's <laughs> up, coach? It's crazy, man. But, um, it worked out for me. I, I don't have no complaints because I know a lot of guys would have killed to be in my situation. But yeah, man, and in 2000, I was a part of the number one recruiting class in the country. Our recruiting class was serious. I mean, we had, we had some players, man. And to know that I was a part of that and I got to meet some of my teammates, I signed my national letter of attendance in February. I met a bunch of my teammates for the Florida Georgia High School All-Star Game on the Florida and the Georgia team in June. And in, in the beginning of June, and I was enrolled in Florida at the end of June because mm -hmm. I had to be there for summer B. So mm -hmm. I got to meet a lot. My my, uh, my roommate, my junior year, his name is Max Starks. I met Max when, we, when he was 18 years old. Wow. Max is 6'8", about 375 pounds. He was that big in high school. So when I met him, you just, so you, you know, I'm a tall guy, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tall, big guy. But, you know, 6'5", 250, 6'8", 370. So when we in the we in the uh, gift shop, and I'm and I'm grabbing something, and his hand was like grabbing it, and I like I said my bad, and I went and I went what I said, hey man, you you can have it, it's yours. I pro I don't want no problems. <laughs> That's crazy, yeah. So um, but um, I'm just curious, did you were you close? Did you did, were you close to deciding on Georgia, or were you always Florida at, at that no, time? No, 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 no. I was close to signing to Georgia, man. I mean, Georgia was Georgia was a big brand back then. Yeah. They. They they knew how to cater uh, to the tight end, uh, and the thing is, Florida wasn't really throwing the ball to the tight end the way Georgia was. But I just look at it like this: if and this is crazy, if I never leave Swainsboro, Georgia, and I and I spend my whole life there, I go to Georgia and not Florida because I haven't experienced anything. Right. Going to Augusta, I got to go to Maryland and Atlanta because I ran track. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to go to football camps because my head coach David Land, who is I argue he's the greatest coach I ever had. He paid for me to go to football because I wanted, listen, man, Georgia wanted me to come to a football camp. I said, I can't, my parents can't afford no football camp. My, my, my coach said, do you want to go to a football camp? I go, yes, sir. He took me. You see what I'm saying? I got recruited heavily. I got recruited heavily by Georgia Tech too. Oh, wow. Georgia Tech wanted me bad. So, anyway, man, look, I didn't realize how big college football was. I was very naive. Like I said, I graduated high school at 17. <laughs> So I didn't realize, because Jim Dunning, his last year of Georgia was 2000. He got fired after that year. Oh, wow. That's when they went to Mark Ritt. Yeah. So, hey, man. And when I, I talk to guys later about it, and, and they say, Randy McMichael, the great tight end that went to Georgia, he would say, Ben, I'm not going to say you the reason why that Jim Dunning got fired, but you was one of the reasons. Because hmm. you was one of the recruits they really wanted. Right. They said, I said, hey, man, what was I ranked in the Southeast as tight end? He says, oh, you was ranked top three. In the Southeast, the whole Southeast, like top three tight end, and you're from the state. So I was like, well, man, I ain't trying to, you know, my bad, you know. <laughs>
Yeah, so what was, so now going to Florida career, what was it like playing underneath a great coach like C. Spurrier and winning that SEC championship and playing in the SEC in general because this high level competition, what was that, what was that, what was it like for you guys to compete? Oh my God. Uh, I, 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 would, I would compare it to if, if we just graduated college, right? And we, and, and, and we interned at quote, the University of Florida football program. Like that's where we interned in that. And then as soon as we get done, the CEO, the Steve Spurrier hires us. Mm -hmm. And we thinking, you know, everything is beautiful. Facilities, food, lodging, everything. Wow. But we got to produce. Right. And we're 17, 18. They're saying, hey, we need you guys to go out. It, <clears throat> it was a well-oiled machine. And well-oiled machines do this. Steve Spurrier, he talked very little because the players did it. Like the player, hey man, this is how we practice. This is how we play. This is how we prepare. We don't talk back. We don't say nothing to the coaches. This is what, and okay, you know, so you just follow the line. Hey right. man, hey, shut up when coaches is talking. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Because, and I'm like, well, why are we doing this? They said, because think about this. Not only do you get the best, you are part of the biggest brand in the state, one of the biggest brands in sports. Mm -hmm. And you might get a chance to go pro. What? You see? <laughs> so, so, and mind you, I'm like, that's a lot of information for. Her. So, I, for me, man, two two thousand was great because I got to be, I got to see it every day. I'm like, dude, this. Sometimes you ask yourself, how am I keeping up with this freaking schedule? How am I keeping up with these players? You know, they go Alex Brown, they go Jabbar Gaffney, they go Rishi Conway, they go Taylor Jacobs, they go Rex Grossman, yeah. you know, they go Gerard Warren. That go, you know, Lito Shepard. I mean, just name after name after name after name, and you're a part of that. So 2000 was great. 2001 was even greater, man. We didn't win the SEC, but we won the Orange Bowl. Mm -hmm. We played against Maryland, who won the ACC that year. And what was crazy, Taylor, this is how good we were. Taylor Jacobs was the, was the Orange Bowl MVP. He played receiver. He only played the first half. He did not play. The, that's how good he, he had like three touchdowns, like 200 yards receiving in the first half. Wow. The game is over. So, I mean, I, listen, Florida is, yeah. Florida is, it's like going to, man, look, it, it's like if you want to, if you, if, if you are, if you um ever want to go to an Ivy League school, it's like going to Harvard. Right. It's like going to, it's like going, it's like going to Princeton. But in the South, when you talk about brands, brands, sure. you say you went to Florida and people go crazy. Saying you win the fall is like saying you playing for the Cowboys in the NFL or the Packers. People go, wait a minute. They'll say you went to Florida. So now Google, they Googling your name and they want to know three things. One, did you win that championship? No. Two, uh, did you play with Tim Tebow? No. But I always get the third one. Did you play with Spurrier? Yes. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's great. It's crazy, man. Because I've seen guys come to Florida and never play. Right. Because because to make it on the field on Saturday, that means you got to be the best player Monday through Friday, and you're going up against the best talent in the freaking world mm -hmm. every day in practice. So the fact that I played it all, man, it, it boggles my mind. Well, that's amazing. Um, yeah, so I want to get to your draft experience now. Obviously, you got drafted in 2004, round two, pick 40, by the Tennessee Titans. And did you, did you get invited to the green room or the draft combine? And um, and, and also, what was it like spending time with your family and waiting? Well, for well I, no, I did not. I did not. I did not get a. I did not get asked to go to the green room. Um, two thousand four. Wow. I did get. I did get invited to the um to the to the uh, combine. The yeah. combine. The co I, I know they should. You know how they do hard knocks. Yeah. They should, they should do that with the combine because it's a freak show, man. It's <laughs> it's crazy because you got the best. Prospects in the world there for like I don't know how many days it is, what four, four or five days? I think four or five. So, yeah. so there go Eli Manning, there go Philip Rivers, mm. right? There go, there go, uh, there's Larry Fitzgerald, there's Michael Clayton, there go, you know, uh, Chris Perry, there go Kevin Jones, there go, you know, you got the best players in the world, right? And this is when this is when the reality hit. You come in, the first thing they do, they get the first thing they put you on this machine, it's like a it's like a machine for your knees. Right. And, you, and all you're doing, it goes from real, it goes from real easy to real hard. Pick, you just kick, you just pump your knee, or pump your leg back and forth. 
they got this little thing. It's got 10 lines on it. Hmm. If 10, if the 10 lines aren't real close together, you will not get drafted. Oh, wow. You ain't done nothing yet. Huh. If nine lines is real close and one line is over there by itself, that means you got bad knees. We can't, we can't draft. I mean, that's how sophisticated it is. Right. So there are guys coming in there saying, man, he got bad knees. And when I t- just imagine being in a training room, nothing on but some shorts, and 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 the set, the, the, the Chargers got this on, the the Packers got this on, the Lions got your right leg looking at it. Hmm. The, the freaking, uh, the Giants got you, and, and they just pulling that like this. Yeah, look at his fingers. And, 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 or standing in a room with nothing but some box of briefs on in a dark room, and they got a light on the freaking, uh, it's a light on the freaking stage, and they, you, they get your height, they get your weight, they get your hand size, they get your arm length. You can, you, can, <coughs> you can see, you can see like images of faces, but you can't see their face. Mm-hmm. You, can hear, you can hear somebody say, tell them to turn around. Tell them, tell them, see out, tell them to stretch out a little farther. I mean, it's a meat, it's a meat market, man. It really, really is. And nothing is a secret. <clears throat> Meaning, thirty-two teams. They'll say, "Hey, true. This is how many uh, personal interviews you got? You got, you know, the NFC East and the AFC South on Monday. You got this many teams." Listen, listen, there are other tight ends in there, right? They, they're talking to me. They're talking to Ben Watson. They're talking to yeah. Kellen Winslow, right? There are guys in the room, they'll say, if I didn't call your name, you don't have personal interviews. Hmm. You got to go to this thing. We call it, uh, I think they call it the market or something. Meaning players that didn't get personal interviews, you, you just go down this hallway. It's a gazillion players hoping that a coach come up to you and talk to you. And man, I, I enjoyed it, but I was so ready for it to be over. It's so mentally draining because you gotta you gotta stand in front of the big room and you know they see they they see how you do interviews. Hey Ben, you know, you just answer. The interview process is a big reason why I went second round. Hmm. More than just my talent. Because when I I, I worked out with Tom Shaw in New Orleans, right. we had an interview coach. The interview coach said, You gotta do one thing. What? Don't say you have a weakness. Hmm. What? Now think about that. He goes, that's in any interview process. If you sit down with anybody and they ask you, man, what are your weaknesses? I'm like, I don't, I don't really have weaknesses. You don't have weaknesses. And you can ask any of my teammates. Dante Stallworth in 2003 was the highest drafted receiver. And mm-hmm. the reason why, he's the only guy in his interview process that didn't reveal a weakness. All the other receivers, oh yeah, I got to work on this one. They show little stuff like that. So, <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, man. But I, like I said, I enjoyed it. I wow. really did. And I was 21 years old, man, watching. Listen, the, the, the coolest part is seeing players that play for other teams in other cities, mm-hmm. saying they fans of yours. I mean, I, oh, man, I, all the Titans was asking me where they run the routes right. And hey, did I run this route right? I'm like, why you asking? Because we saw you at Florida, man. We, you know, I'm like, yeah. You know, so it was, it was, it was the best, man. I, I, I came out with Ben Watson, the Titan of Georgia. He was a freak. The dude did yeah, like man. 35 reps. <laughs> he was like 35 reps on the bench. He ran like a 4 5 0. The Wonder League had 50 questions. He got a 49 because he only had time to get, he ain't have time to do his 50th question. That's wow. how smart he was. Wow. That's amazing. And he had, what a career he had too. Amazing. And, oh, oh I, I hate me. I, I love and hate Ben Watson for, for the same reason. We got the same first name. Oh. So in 2004, <laughs> yeah. the New England Patriots said with the 32nd pick in the 2004 NFL draft, the New England Patriots select Benjamin. And I'm like, oh, they said Watson, tied it out of University of Georgia. I said, I hate you, Ben Watson. But I obviously I love him, man. You know, I, I think he wanted to, he works for SEC Network now, man. He, he played yeah. for a long time. Yeah. And so, uh, so speaking of Tennessee, you, you go in there as a rookie, um, and you see, you play play with players like Steve McNair, uh, Derek Mason, Albert Hainsworth. If you look at the defense, you guys had a great defense. And actually, Albert Hainsworth was on the show here too uh, recently before. Um, so what was it like playing for Tennessee and uh, and playing with quarterback Steve McNair? Man, there was I, I there was nobody like man. Like, I ain't never seen, I've never seen a football player like that. Like, never. And I played with some of the best of them, man. I ain't never, I ain't never met a player like Mac. There are certain people, listen, Michael Jordan was built to play basketball. Yeah. Uh, Michael Jackson was built to sing, dance, and entertain, right? Michael Phelps was built to swim. Steve McNair was built to play quarterback. He was built to do it. And when you see somebody like that, 
that's that big of a name, but that humble of a person. It's like, I mean, he's about as humble. This dude, I mean, he drove a Dodge Ram. Wow. He drunk moonshine. <laughs> and, and, and he, when I first got there, he would only call me Rook. So my friend, he got, so this is what, this is what I knew Mac knew my name. He never called me, he would call me Rook or he'd call me 84. Rook, 84, Rook, 84. Oh, no, I was eight, I was 86. My uh my my rookie year, but one time, <laughs> one time my rookie year we got meetings and the meetings be real close to time. They don't give you that much time to lead the meeting, go get tape, or get on the field. So the meeting is over. I run. He said. Uh, he said. Uh, he was trying to remember. He said. Uh, uh, true. And I stopped. He goes, okay. "How old are you?" I go, "Oh, I'm, I went. Man, I wasn't twenty. I wasn't." I, oh my God, I wasn't even 22. I said, I'm 21. He said, I'm 31. Hmm. He said, he said, he telling the offensive coordinator, I'm 10 years older than him. I need more time than him. Wow. And, and, and Mac was, man, listen, if you ever carved out a, a, a quarterback that could do it all, could run, throw. I mean, if you go to the University of Georgia, University of Florida, Alabama, and you the third overall pick, I expect that. Right. Mac went to Alcorn State. He got drafted third overall by to the Houston, to the Houston uh, Oilers at the time. So Mac, man, may he rest in peace. I caught a touchdown pass from Steve McNair, man. I'm going to tell my kids one day, man, mm-hmm. I played with Mac Nine. I played with that dude. So, yeah, man. And and like I said, man, I mean, you, you know, you talked about Albert. Albert was a freak. The I say this all the time. The best football player I've ever played with, me, was Steve McNair. Like, he's yeah. the he's yeah. the best. The, 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 the the best, the best player I've ever seen, like day in and day out, was Keith Bullock. Mm. Keith Bullock was yeah. Jesus Christ. The most gifted athlete I've ever played with is Pac-Man Jones. Mm-hmm. Adam Pac-Man Jones was, wow. <laughs> he was, and, and I'm so happy how he, I know he just recently did an interview with uh Shannon Sharp Club. Yeah. I'm so happy how his how his career ended. This Pac-Man Jones was good. Because I used to have to block him on special teams, and he still was good. I'm like, Pat, you better do something. This kid was amazing, man. So, yeah, man. Plus, I, but I played with Derrick Mason. Yeah. I mean, the, the best – what I needed for my career was Aaron Kenny. Without Aaron Kenny, number 88 tight end, I don't have any inkling of a career, man. He took me under his wing. He showed me how to be a pro, showed me how to be a professional, showed me how to be a family man, showed me how to really – take pride in what I was doing, to not get too high with the highs, too low with the lows, keep it in the middle. So EK, you know, I played with Travis Henry and I played with I played with uh Jared Payton, Walter Payton. So oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> so and, and, and we became really, really good friends, man. I got to I mean Jared Payton's so freaking sport, man. He's on the phone one time. He goes, all right, I'll take it. So he gets off the phone like, man, who are you talking to? That's my mom, man. Michael Jordan trying to sell me uh his BMW. What the hell? We like what? <laughs> and, but but this but this is the arrogance though. Here's the arrogance. Michael Jordan sold Jared Payton his BMW. It had a two three on the back. You know what Jared did? He took the two off because he was number thirty three and made it. I said, "You gotta take the two off." Yeah, I was spoiled. Spoiled, spoiled, spoiled. So that, that's 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 the type of experiences I had when I was with the Titans, man. Wow, that's crazy. So um, did, did you ever think to yourself maybe you could you could have spent the whole your whole career with Tennessee? But I know NFL is a business and players move around all the time, but did you ever did you ever think to yourself you could have saved at Tennessee? But what was, but you got to spend time with the Buccaneers and the Raiders. What was your experience like from moving from team to team? I, I wish, you know, the, the end of my career wasn't as good as the start of it, and I saw the understanding. The I wish I could have spent every every waking moment with the Titans. I got to grow up as a young man there. You know, they welcome me. I mean, the Tennessee is like a big, gigantic city, but it's a country yeah. little city town, you know, Music City, USA. So I didn't have to, I mean, my like I said, from the state of Georgia, went to college in Florida, got drafted by Tennessee, so I didn't have to leave the South. And, you know, when I went to the Tampa Bay Bucks, crazy story about that was when I, at my pro day at Florida, mm-hmm. I didn't know this until he, John Gruden was with the Bucks. He drove up from Tampa to work me out. And he said, Ben, you had so many people trying to work you out. I couldn't, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you freaking John Gruden. He's like, I was going to work you out as the head coach. Because he wasn't, he, he, you know, John Gruden loved football. Right. So in 2008, when I became a free agent, free agency started in like March, just say it started March 31st at, you know, 12 a.m. The very first call I got was, John, hey, Ben, this is John Gruden. He like, 
Hey, Ben, this is John Gruden down here in Tampa Bay, man. Right now it's 75 degrees, you know, uh, very, very slight humidity. You know, right here, you know, we right here by Bush Gardens. It was something about him remembering me four years later, right. watching my career. And he gave me an opportunity. He also cut me. I also got cut by the Bucks. But yeah. I think I think the thing is this. Lane Kiffin, the head coach of, of Ole Miss, yeah. was the head. When I went to the, when I went, I went from, this is how my week went. Played Atlanta on Sunday with the Bucks. Went to watch the film on Monday. Went to watch the film on Monday, got cut on Tuesday. Yeah. I didn't know I got cut until my brother said, hey, man, you just got cut by the Bucks. What do you mean? You on ESPN bottom line. They said you just got let go. I'm like, what? <laughs> I drove up home. I saw myself. I got cut. Mark Dominic, who yeah. was the scout that scouted me, told me, hey, Ben, we let you go. But I got some teams calling about you. Wednesday, hmm. I fly out to Atlanta. No, no. Third, uh, Wednesday night, I, 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 I work out. I work out Thursday for Atlanta, but it's too close to game time. They fly me to they fly me to Oakland Thursday night. I wake up there Friday morning. I get in the car. I don't know where I am. Like I, I know nothing about Oakland. I don't know nothing. I get them. I get in. The, I get in the car. They drive me over to the facility. I go, you know, put on some workout stuff. They give me some. They give me some cleats. They give me some gloves. Lane Kiffin, who's the head coach. I go out there and work out with the, with the tight ends coach. They go to run game coordinator. They go to Greg Knapp, the offensive coordinator. Hmm. I'm running routes, running routes, running routes. Listen, I get done running routes, and everybody looks off like this. I turn and look. Al Davis is in his office upstairs. He has <laughs> he lets back all these blinds. He walks up to this this gigantic glass wall. Hmm. He looks at me. He points at me and says, "That's how I became a Raider." Wow. I, I, I walk out of there. I told take a shower. I go sign my contract. I, I, I get on a plane to fly to Buffalo. I know two people on the plane. I know D'Angelo Hall, who got drafted with me, and I know Gerard Warren, who played with me in Florida. And that's that's how I ended up a, a, a then Oakland Raider. So hmm. the NFL is crazy, man. But once again, I've never been that far away from home. I've never been. I was in California. I didn't know nobody. And I, I, at first, I thought I was going to be miserable. I ended up having so much fun, man, going to San Francisco, San Jose, to go to Gate Bridge, because I was on IR at a certain point. But, uh, hey, man, that was my last year in the NFL. I could have played a lot longer. I do wish I could have spent my whole career uh, with, the, with, the, with the Titans. But when I got drafted, I, I only wanted three things. I never cared about Pro Bowls. I never cared about all yeah. pros. I would have been great to, to play in a – uh, Super Bowl. I wanted to be the first guy drafted from the team I, I came from. So in Florida, I was the first guy drafted in 2004 from all my Florida teammates. Oh wow! I wanted to be the first guy drafted to the team I went to. I was I was a second round pick, but I was the first pick for the Titans that year. We <laughs> had 14 draft picks that year, and I was I was the first one. Travis LeBoy and Antoine Odom was was uh other two guys that went. The, and I want and I wanted to walk away on my own terms. So in 2009. I had a workout with the Arizona Cardinals. Ken Wizard Hunt was the head coach. They flew me out. They go to run game corner. They go to offensive corner. They go to head coach. They go to GM. They go to president. They wanted me to sign with the Arizona Cardinals. Oh, and wow. I told them. Hmm. I said, man, I appreciate this opportunity. And they were dumbfounded. When I said, man, I appreciate it, but I, you know, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll let you guys know. They were like this. Because huh. like, the NFL doesn't wait on nobody, right. man. They, no, they, yeah. whatever they so and, and, and I make no mistake about it. My transition away from football was a rough one because I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I did it my way, man. If I had to go back, I'll do it the same way. I have no regrets about it. Hey, you you're doing great things right now after your football career, which is amazing. And by the way, I rest in peace, Al Davis, rest in peace, Greg Knapp, too. And uh two great losses be, be it's crazy. And and uh and our uh, and our uh, rest in peace, uh Floyd Reese, the general manager that uh, that actually uh, brought me in in 2004. 2004 and 2005, Floyd Reese was the general manager. He the one that drafted me in 2000, in 2019, 2019 when, the, when the draft was in Nashville. I was working the draft. I was there working the draft as a media personality. Oh, okay. And you're talking about something coming full circle. I walk into the media tent, and who's sitting there? Freaking Floyd Reeves. Mm -hmm. And we just sat there and we talked and we talked. And I asked him, man, he, he said, being number one, you were ahead of your time. They wasn't using the tight end like they're using them now. He said, number two, I would, he said, if I had to go back to 2004, I would draft you in the first round and not the second round. Wow. He said, number three, he said, you're the type of player that people are looking for as organizationally because bigger than the stats and the yards, 
we don't have to worry about you not being a great brand ambassador. And that was humbling for me, man, because when people ask, man, why did I get drafted? I got to ask the guy who drafted me. He said, oh, man, he said you was a, you had, you had the highest drafter on our board, and we knew we didn't have to work. If I would phone ring in the middle of the night, we know they ain't going to be talking about you. So, man, he rest in peace, man. I didn't know Floyd Reese. I had cancer, man. But he he became a friend, man. I got to go upstairs and really talk to him about life. I used to, Our love of cars, family, <laughs> music. We just used to talk like, like people. It wasn't GM the player. So, mate, the, to the to the Reese family, you know, and uh, Greg Knapp as well. I got a chance, got a chance to know Greg when I was out there uh, with the with the Raiders. So, yeah, man, some great men I've had a chance to be a part of. And also, um, I want to uh, obviously you brought up Lane Kiffin. I just want to wish him a speedy recovery. He, he just got tested positive for COVID. Uh, Lane, Kiffin. yeah, yeah, yeah. L- L- listen, Lane Kiffin uh, was he was too young. It's Lane Kiffin was the head coach at Ole Miss. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, with the head coach with the Raiders uh, back in 2008. I had just got done playing against his, his father with a freaking defensive coordinator, Money Kiffin from the Bucks. So I got, and I and I earned the respect of Money Kiffin. The great when people talk about the Tampa two defense, that's Money Kiffin. So yeah, man, man, Lane Kiffin, uh, get a get a speedy recovery, man. I think he's great for college football. I'm happy that he's back in the SEC, yeah. in the SEC West. He is the, he is just there to be a pest. Yeah. Two things: yeah. to beat Mississippi State and to be a pest to Alabama every time they play. Yeah, so now looking back to your NFL career and your college career, how great are you to be in this position, um, having a great, uh, obviously great career, and now covering the game on ESPN Radio, and then you have, you're an author now, you have a book, and then you have a, and, and you're a speaker. So what's that been like for you, having all those things after your NFL career? Uh, it's a credit to the people that helped groom me. It's a, it's a credit to Ron Zook when I was at the University of Florida help me understand that going to these hospital visits to Shan's Hospital was more of carving out who I am as a person and getting away from who I am as an athlete. Uh, B.J. Bennett, a guy who I met uh, back in 2009 when um, he introduced radio to me. He was, a, you know, uh, he was a young uh, up and coming radio personality. He's who he's the reason why I'm on the radio now with three and out with Kevin Thomas, BJ Bennett, and myself. The speaker aspect of it goes back to the University of Florida and just understanding that I got more to give. That my story is intertwined with other stories. It's not. It's not about what I'm doing. It's about what can I do for you. The author piece once again comes back to BJ Bennett. He he's the editor of SouthernPigs.com, and when I first met him, we were talking about the book way back when. That's before the wives and the kids and the families and the bills. But you, th- you fast forward to 2020, you know, the pandemic hit, man, and it gave us a chance to really say, look, man, if we're ever going to do this book, we need to do it. So chapter one became chapter two, chapter two became chapter three. And I will say this, to everybody that wants to write a book, it is not the writing part. It is the editing part. Editing part is, is so shout out to Timothy Bond of True Vine Publishing. He's my publisher up there in Nashville, Tennessee. Shout out to Miko, uh, Miko Isidore. Who is my who is the co-author with me of my children's book, Judy and John at judyandjohn.com. And this, I'm just having fun with my life. Mm-hmm. I used to really, really think that I can only do things as long as that that thing, uh, you know, I, you know, I was an extension of that thing. Like I can only be an extension of that thing. As I gotten older, the reason why I, I think I'm I thrive in what I'm doing is now things are an extension of me. It's just an extension of me. So books, speaking, radio. Uh, even my nonprofit, the Uncommon Crew, mm-hmm. uh, you know, philanthropy, humanitarianism. Because at the end of the day, I care about being one thing. At least I care about being a daddy first. I have yeah. three children. They are my legacy. BJ, Mia, and Yaya are my legacy. I care about being a great uncle. So Christian, Kirsten, Josh, uh, Ryan, Jalen, Jamie, and Julian. Those, you know, those are, you know, so you know, being a great brother to my to my sister, Carrie Ann, and you know, uh, and Nikki, and to my brother Lucas, and being a great son to my mom and dad, Cheryl and John. So. The things I hold dear are family. Well, well, faith, then family, then everything else, man. Is just what I'm, what I'm enjoying doing. I'm if I if my book becomes a New York Times bestseller, yeah. My mom thinks I'm gonna get interviewed by Michael Strahan. <laughs> but I, I would just tell people, man, just don't be afraid to lose. No, yeah. See, I, I focus so much on trying to win, win, win. But like, no, dude, this. How do you handle losing? How do you handle failure? How do you handle? Deion Sanders said something. He goes. Are you, he says, are you still content if you don't get what you want? Right. And yeah. I thought that was very powerful. He said, I, he liked the fish. He said, I went out of the fish. I didn't catch one thing, but I was still content. So my contentment is not in what I'm doing. My contentment is in the opportunity to do it. Man, I look, when I put out this book, I didn't, to be quite, I didn't think I would sell but 10 of them. Mm-hmm. And now I don't even know how many I've sold. Why? 
because bentroop84.com is where you can, where I want you to go get it. But it's available everywhere books are sold. It's available at Target and Barnes and Nobles and Books a Million and Google Books and Kindle. And so from this, like I said, man, I'm not naive. I know that my life is truly, truly blessed, man, because from seven, from age 17 to now age 39, my life has been in the limelight. I yeah. walked away from the limelight and came back with radio. Yeah. So I asked myself, how do I live my life? And I live it through an attitude of gratitude from the people that helped me do it. Without BJ, I'm not on the radio. Without BJ, I don't write a book. Without Mika, I don't write a book. Without Ron Zook, I don't understand who I really am away from football. Without walking away from football, I think I'm only going to be known as a football player. Right. Without becoming a father, I don't understand what how great it is being a freaking father. So my life is about trial and error. I mean, I'm a, I'm a lose more than I win. My losing don't just, my losing just doesn't look like losing. To you, I was like, I lost. No, you didn't. Yeah. And I learned how to be process driven and not results driven. Mm. I care about the process. I care about making sure I come on with people like yourself. Because for you to reach out to me to, to think that I'm intrigued enough, whatever episode I am, it, this stuff, because listen, in order, in order to be a has been, at one point, you was that guy, mm -hmm. no matter what you was on. So I think that. It has to be, I get I get a chance to show people who I am as a person. And I'm enjoying it, man. I don't know where I'm going to be. My goal one day is to host the ESPY Awards or the Football Awards. Mm -hmm. So so I can stand up there and I can crack jokes on like Peyton Manning and, you know, Patrick <laughs> Mahomes. But I represent country boys right. all over the world. Mm -hmm. I am from, I'm a country boy from Swainsboro that uh, I, I hope, and country, and listen, I, I represent small town living, but my perspective is just through the roof. I'm not a perennial low jumper, man. My, people say, if your dreams don't scare you, they ain't big enough. My dreams is out there, man. I dream with my eyes open. I tell my son all the time, I say, son, the only difference between you and your daddy is my imagination. I imagine what I'm becoming instead of hoping to become it. I'm just, I'm, we'll see where this ride takes me, man. But my kids, like anybody else's kids, my kids want to know about the iPhones, the PS5s, TikTok, they don't care yeah. nothing about it. Listen, they like the fact that daddy is an author and a former Florida Gator and Tennessee Titan. But if I ain't, but if I ain't buying that PS5, daddy, whatever. They don't, they don't want to hear all that. So my, my, my life is grand, man. And as long as I'm doing for people, as long as people like yourself always want me to come on, I'm always make my, I'm never ever, no people say, I don't got the same accessibility before I blew up. No, I'm still the same me. Mm -hmm. If you could get me before, you can get me now. Yeah. You notice when you were talking to me, you talking to me. I don't have a publicist. I don't got a manager. <laughs> I don't got my people to call. Your people know I am my people. So, yeah, man, I'm just enjoying this ride, man. I, it's humbling because I tell people all the time, my life would have been just fine, being just fine. God saw it to be something different. And at 39 years old, man, I'm about to have my first book come out. You know, I mean, I'm coming up finished the Ben True Story. Yeah. Available at bandtrubator4.com. Go to judyandjohn.com, the J-U-D-E-E-A-N-D-J-O-N.com. If you got kids, Judy and John's mask, I got, I mean, that's so, we, that sold a whole bunch of copies, man. So I got people reading my children's books. Now they finna read my book. And if my book become a Netflix special, I will not be playing myself. I'm gonna try to get Denzel's son or somebody <laughs> <to play. laughs> That's it. Yeah, I mean, that uh, we're, we're definitely gonna check your book out, Uncommon and Unfinished. Uh, check, everyone go check that out too that's gonna be amazing and uh but a couple uh i want to ask you about a couple more things here before i let you go uh what are you most looking forward to as a former football player with college football coming back now today and then next week is nfl so what are you most looking forward to just to see fans back in the stadiums uh i hope the, the one thing i the one thing i'm looking forward to with college football is hopefully it can it can continue to lead the way like i understand that we're going through a global pandemic and and you hear this word called normalcy right <coughs> normalcy is over with meaning packed stadiums is one thing we want to continue to pack them and I'm telling people listen getting the vaccine is not about it's not about just you it's about those around you mm -hmm. wearing masks is bigger than just you it's about those, making sacrifices but listen I love the NFL on Sundays yeah. but the NFL on Sunday is just that's all we got the greatest level of football happens on Thursday nights in middle school, Friday nights in high school, and freaking Saturday. Because Saturday gives you the greatest variety of sports and football you've ever seen. You got your favorite team. 
But you know how you just click on your team don't come on at four. So you, you turn on at 12 o'clock and it's BYU and Coastal Carolina. Right. You got this kid named Zach Wilson at Coastal Carolina. You got this kid, you know, I mean, you got Jamie Chadwell and those guys at Coastal Carolina, you know, and you think to yourself, BYU about to beat the breaks off of Coastal Carolina, and Coastal Carolina beat them. It, it's the stories, man. It's so many players that are so good, that are so worthwhile. You got you got the tradition of the of the teams. You got the, the high profileness of the freaking coach. You got a Heisman Trophy candidate in Spencer Rattler at Oklahoma. But then something like this will happen. Virginia Tech will play uh, UNC, you know, on uh, last night. And UNC is picked to, you know, play Clemson in the ACC championship game. Sam Howell yeah. is a chance to win the Heisman, and they lose. What? <laughs> that is college for – it's yeah. about as unpredictable. Now, if, now, if Alabama loses to Miami on Monday – if Alabama loses to Miami – Nick Saban, good Lord. I, I, I want to see that. But I just think that the NFL is great, man. I think the NFL is where the best players in the world play. Aaron Donalds, the Patrick Mahomes, the Tom Brady's, you know, uh, you know, the Travis Kelsey's and so on and so forth. College football is where they bred at. Right. That, that, that's, that's the next crop. Who's I like when it's who's gonna be the next, like who's gonna be the next Lamar Jackson? <laughs> who's gonna who's gonna be the next? Julio Jones, shout out to them Tennessee Titans, got Julio Jones. By the way. <laughs> so no, I, I I think that for me, I'm a fan first, man, right. and I just got to do it. I got to grace these fields. So when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you know former players or whomever. I'm saying enjoy this time, and that's whether you play or not. Because once again, as a true freshman in Florida, I didn't really play. As a sophomore, I played a little bit. As a junior, I was a true backup, and I got to start my senior year. So when people start talking about Florida, Georgia, Hall of Famer, first in All-American, first in All-AC, second round draft pick, that's because I was I bought in. So what David Land told me when I was at Butler High School, I applied that when I was at Florida, and I went from Steve Spurry to runs up. So mm-hmm. I so I went from the highs to the highs. So, uh oh, eight and five, eight and five. I lost more games in one year with Zook than I that I lost in two years. Spur you, but forget being a great player. I never cared about being a great player. Hmm. I was the greatest teammate there was. I will put my teammate ability against anybody. I don't care with the Florida, Florida State, Georgia, Tennessee. And because I put the team before me, I got to do all that other stuff, man. I didn't I didn't know I was an All-American until I was in the bowl game. I see yeah, and I'm sick as a dog. I got I think I might have a flu or pneumonia or something. And Ron Zook said, you're going to be the first ever All-American, first of All-American, don't even play in the game. I said, wait, 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 what? Who's an All-American? You are. What? And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I said, I'm an All-American. He said, you were first team All-American. He said, and you were first team All-SEC. And you were John Mackey World Finals. And you're going to be a Hydra. And I'm, and I'm saying to myself, I, it didn't help me. I was still sick. But I, I would just say, man, Saturdays, Saturdays is what? There is nothing like Florida either, man. Whatever college you go to, hey, May God bless you, but with, but the swamp. I'm telling you, people, man, that thing is that thing is rocking. It's hot. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you you forget how hot it is. You run out. Oh my God! <laughs> but it's the greatest, man. And like I said, I never knew that way back in 2000. Hmm. 21 years later, I will still be talking about it. Still be getting remembered for it. So from Nashville to Gainesville to Tampa to Alameda or you know Oakland. Man, I, 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 owe, I owe those Lane Kiffin, Jeff Fisher, Ron Zook, Steve Spurrier, David Land, you know what I'm saying? John, I, I owe the, the Glazier family, the Adams family, the, the, you know, uh, the Davis family. I appreciate it. I appreciate all of them because they gave a country boy a chance to go out there, man, and, you know, run around with that brown ball, as Stephen yeah. said. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> so I want to ask you about two tight ends uh, here, uh, Darren, Darren Waller and Kyle Pitts. And obviously – uh, John Gruden coaches Darren Waller. So, uh, what do you like about Darren Waller's game? And also, Kyle Pitts, a former uh, Florida Gator like, like you, and wearing the same number. And w- w- does he remind you of yourself, or d- is he something different? <laughs> uh, I would love to say that Kyle Pitts reminds me of myself. No, uh, Kyle Pitts. Wow, Kyle, You know, all the tight ends, right? At, 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 all the tight ends called to say, "Man, we're gonna we're gonna meet up at the tight end pool." So, you know, all, all, all the tight ends came. All the tight ends came. And people go, hey, man, what's the name of the pool? They say, it's called Kyle's Pool. What? 
Kyle Pitts owns this pool. So while some of us on the deep end, some of us on the shallow end, this dude came and did a cannonball. Kyle Pitts, 6'6", 250, 245, wow. 250, ran a 4 got the longest wingspan, didn't drop a pass in 2020. Hmm. For what? 220 some yards receiving, four touchdowns in one game. <laughs> so Kyle Pitts, Kyle Pitts is coming into the, it's funny, in 2000, the, um, in 2000, when I'm coming into the, the SEC, it ain't like it is now. Kyle Pitts benefited from, the, he made the tight end position, man, not just a position worth playing, yeah. a position worth watching. This kid was amazing. You fast forward to Darren Waller. Oh my freaking God. <laughs> Darren Waller's story is about as good as it is. Yeah. Overcoming drug addiction. Yep. Guy, guy from Atlanta, went to Georgia Tech, you know, in a, in a run-heavy offense, didn't even really throw the ball to get drafted to the, to the, to the, uh, to the Baltimore Ravens. Mm -hmm. I do this thing on my show called Troop Talk. Right. I do one, like, feature interview a week. I got to interview Darren Waller. Oh, okay. Darren Waller comes on. He goes, "What's up, Troop man?" I'm like, "What's up?" He's like talking to me like, "Man," and I was like, well, he said, "Man, I, man, I remember you, man. I grew up watching." He's like, "I grew up watching you at Florida State the third, and we just going back and forth." Darren Waller represents two entities. Darren Waller represents great football players and great people, right? Because every time he speaks up on behalf of you know, you know, of the abuse of the of the drug abuse or the or the you know a substance abuse community. He becomes that face, just like um, Brandon Marshall is for mental health. So I watch number one, Darren Waller is a hell of a freaking type. Good, he's that good. Like I'm like Darren Waller doing things we are like this is normal. Like I know that Travis Kelsey is the best tight end league. I know that some people may say that you know uh, you know George Kittle might be the second best. I would I would put up you know I would bet Darren yeah. Waller might be number two, number three, if not. And the thing is, the reason why I say Darren Waller might be number one, and this is no offense to Mr. Or Mr. Carr, but that's who throws him the ball, mm -hmm. right? Now, how, how, how good do you think Darren Waller be if he played with Patrick Mahomes? Uh, number one tight end in the world. <laughs> so, with, and for with, Darren Waller, man, people don't get – I mean, why is such a good football player? Because he all had to overcome life. He had to overcome himself. All right. And, and I will say this, man. I kind of, I've heard his balls. I've, I've heard his music pretty good with the music, man. I say, look, man, you got to be careful when you put that music out there because I thought you were going to sound like Shaq. <laughs> you didn't. You sound like this. So, yeah, man, Darren Waller, huge fan. I mean, obviously, I'm loving the fact that Kyle Pitts is at Atlanta wearing number eight. I think he's going to be great. I think the fact that tight end you, is, they got that now with all the great best tight ends coming together. And it's one thing to have the brotherhood of your team. It's another thing to have a tight end like Travis Kelsey calling you after the game saying, hey, man, make sure that when you're doing this, you're keeping your head up. Make sure when you coming out of this route. Because when you can teach it to other players at your position, they can't, you can't play the position better than Travis Kelsey. Yeah. Travis Kelsey got a shot to be the GOAT. And Travis Kelsey playing at the same place that Tony Gonzalez played. Right. So, I, like I said, man, I – People go when when Kyle Pitts that Florida man. Kyle Pitts remind me of you. I'm like no 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 he doesn't. Kyle Pitts, Kyle Pitts is in the lane all by himself. But I will say this one day, I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna have a sit down interview with Kyle Pitts, and I'm gonna do my best. And the first thing I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say uh what's I'm gonna say I'm I'm, I'm gonna say what's up Kyle? I'm gonna say what's up? I'm gonna say man, you think you was better than me, man? And I'm gonna see what he says. Cause mind you, I don't really care who's better than what. Yeah. But Kyle, I'm, listen, I'm happy that Kyle Pitts went to, went to Florida, not Georgia, Florida State, because then I would have to like, like, like him, but not really like him because of the college he went to. But no, man, I'm happy I'm happy for the tight end position. Yeah. Because, yep. because the guy that took the tight end position to the next level in the NFL is Gronk. Gronk took Gronk. it to another level, yeah. and he's still doing it. Like, people are like, hey, man, Gronk didn't look that good during the regular season. Did you see him in the Super Bowl? You Did you see him? Okay, he, he makes plays for the count. So, hey, man, the tight end position is here to stay. I hope Kyle Pitts goes out there and makes it happen. Uh, I love John o. Smith. Even yeah, though I yeah. With the freaking Titans. Yeah. Come on, Titans. You should have gave him freaking money. <laughs> but, uh, you know, hey, man, I think the tight end position is special. I love I love, I love, love Noah Fan. I love Irv Smith. I love, I love uh, you know, Hawkinson. Mm -hmm. I love all those guys, man, coming to the league. I, I, I love uh, 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 Friar, Friar Muth. 
tight end came out of Penn State. I love Jaseki. I love Andrew. If you play tight end, I love you. <laughs> I think that's the best position on the field, man. So, I'm, yeah. but I am biased. Yes, I am. Biased. Yeah. Speaking of John o. Smith, we met him in person this year. He was awesome, and uh, he was. He, we went to this NFL. Event. I owe Delaney Walker too. Oh my God, I yeah. miss Delaney. So I love Delaney Walker, man. Miss. Oh, uh, he's another great one too. And actually, we uh, we went to this NFL event in Jersey, and um. Uh, we met we uh we the uh, John o. Smith was there. We met him in person. He was uh, awesome to talk to, and he said he's ready to play with the Patriots. So let's see. It's gonna it, him and him and him and Hunter Hearing, man. It's gonna be scary, man. Them two together. Yeah. It's gonna be scary. No, no Cam, but you know they got they got they got Mac Jones. Yeah. So before we get to the last two things here, uh, here here's a serious question: Have you been on Shannon Sharp show yet? I have not been on Shannon Sharp show yet. If I'm ever. If I'm ever blessed enough to go on Shannon Sharp's show, I will finally get to tell Shannon Sharp, one, uh, he's the reason why I wore number 84, and two, I wish I could have upheld the tight end position at a level that he's played at, and three, I would tell him, he is my he is my greatest tight end of all time. He is the great right. to me. We got to make that happen for you. We got to make that happen. And, and, and listen, 84 to 84, and, <clears throat> and he's from, and he's, I think, from Glenville, Georgia, like a little country uh -huh. town in Georgia, so yeah. country boy like myself. Yeah, we got to make that happen for you, Ben. Let's go. We got to do that. <laughs> but um, but the last few things here, um, we were, our team is part of this foundation. We're big into foundations and nonprofits like what you have. So we're, uh, we're into we're part of this foundation. It's called the Hugh Jackson Foundation. He's a former NFL coach. I'm sure you know him. And uh, he's, on, he's now the offensive coordinator at Tennessee State with Eddie George. And uh, we're trying to help him prevent human trafficking, making sure the community stays safe and the kids stay safe. So We'll send you the foundation so you can go check it out. Oh yeah, man, Hugh Jack, man, I'm happy for him. I'm happy for I'm happy for Hugh Jack. Him being him coming back to an HBCU like TSU, old Jefferson Street. Mm -hmm. I know about old TSU, old home Antonio Rogers, Camardi. Yeah. And um, you know, I'm loving the fact out of the Eddie George, old Eddie is is there. I, I love what I love what Deion Sanders is doing for the HBCUs, elevating. And I love the fact that I think JSU played TSU. Hmm. So I know, you know, so yeah, man, I yeah, definitely send me the foundation, man. And I will say my my organization, man, the Uncommon Crew, that's uncommon CRU.com. It's about helping high school boys just through exposure. It's not about trying to reinvent the wheel. It's not about telling them what they're not gonna be. It's me using my ex using my influence, taking exposure that I've been given to give it to them and you know, try to push them in the direction they want to go, man, through uh through uh, you know, whether it's military, whether it's post uh high school education, whether it's uh culinary school, whether the trade school, whatever they want, we are trying to help them get there and we don't need nothing in return for it. So that's the Uncommon Crew, CRU.com. Go there, man, uh, donate. But uh, yeah, man, I am I never thought I'd be doing none of this stuff, man. You sitting there asking about all this stuff in Florida and Tennessee. Man, I'm a country boy, man. I like I like, I like sweet tea. Yeah. And for people that say it's sweet tea, iced tea, no, iced tea is is dirty water with ice in it. That's not that's not sweet tea. Put sugar in it, that makes it sweet tea. But uh, no, man, I my life, I, I just sit here and shake my head, man. Hmm. I heard Kevin Hart say something. He goes, "You just have to love what you do." Mm -hmm. Like clear, like some, you just got to love what you do, and you got to love the people you do it for. Right. And I do both. I love what I do from radio, to speaking. The philanthropy, to being a daddy, to being an uncle, to being a son, to being a friend, and I love the people I do it for. And as long as they let me do it, man, they listen. Man, I still got a job. I mean, I tell my, I tell my boss all the time, man. And do I, you want me to come to work next week? Like, yeah, because if you fire me, you know, that's it. Everybody has to leave. You're not firing me, and then everybody, no. Yeah. But and I just be joking with it. But nah, man, I would say, man, just just enjoy this thing, man. Don't don't take it too serious. Like you said, you got. My my podcast, eighty four reasons, is gonna be uh, it's gonna be uh, starting here real soon, and I'll get a chance to just you know give other people a platform to come on come on my platform to be able to you know you know tell me a little bit about themselves. Yeah, and the last thing here, would you like to say anything to all the nurses, doctors, and essential workers right now? Uh, y'all are one in a million. I got a chance to speak at uh. At uh, Fort Stewart, uh, B.J. Bennett's uh, brother, J.T., he's, he's, uh, he's in the Army National Guard, and uh, they got called to go overseas uh, a couple of years back. And he wanted me to come speak to him. And I'm like, well, what do I say to, you know? So I would say they are one to me. Never, ever think that your impact is not being felt. Don't let the doubters drown out the support. Because I know, you know, just keep fighting the good fight. Sometimes you're not going to get that thank you. Sometimes you, people are not going to say, oh, we appreciate you. Let me let me speak for those that do and don't by saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Because without y'all, 
the world is not what it is. And not just because of the global pandemic. We should have been saying thank you well before this. I'm sorry that it took a global pandemic for us to notice what y'all do day in and day out. So for what you do day in and day out, for the you know, essential workers, nurses, doctors, you know, I mean, from the sanitation, everybody that has to do with us, thank y'all because, you know, sometimes the money doesn't, doesn't, you know, really like, you know, like show just how much appreciation we have. But thank you to you guys. I appreciate it. And I hope that one day the world finds a way to uh, show you guys a level of appreciation. Maybe we put in some type of legislation to say, if you were an essential worker during this time, we give you some type of, you know, some type of trust fund for your family and some type of uh, monetary, uh, uh, you know, uh, award for you and whatever. And they say, well, being how much it should be, let them decide. I don't want to decide, let them decide what they get because you can't put a price tag on what you guys do for us. Yeah, well said. And there it is. That wraps up episode 893 with former Florida Gator tight end, NFL tight end, Ben Troop. You can find him on ESPN Radio. He's an author, speaker. Go check out his new book, uh, Uncommon and Unfinished. And he has a children's book out there. He has a nonprofit organization. Go follow him on all social media formats. Man, this has been powerful, an honor, a uh, great conversation. And like I said earlier, we would like to have you back on the show so you can meet the full team. But keep up the great work, man. Uh, and uh, thank you again for coming on. Appreciate it.